Okay, welcome back, everyone. We are live in Las Vegas for IBM Pulse, IBM's Big Cloud Show. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the studio from the noise. This is SiliconANGLE's exclusive coverage of IBM Pulse. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined by my co-host Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.org, research group here within the CUBE organization. And our next guest is Matt Kaju, CIO of Infinity Red Bull Racing. Welcome to theCUBE. Yeah, thank you. So Red Bull and racing kind of go hand in hand. Um, let's talk about uh, technology meets racing. Okay. Uh, as a CIO, you're, everything's in your hands. Data-driven cars these days is all the rage. So uh, tell us a little about the, um, your environment and okay. uh, the application, and then we can dive into some of the fun facts. Okay, yeah, no problem. So my team is responsible for the applications and underlying infrastructure that we use to design, make, and race Formula One cars. So we have over 200 applications in the company, and we make heavy use of simulations for things like computational fluid dynamics, for example, to design the shape of the car. Um, we also do a lot with data analytics to make the right decisions during a race event. So our infrastructure, we have hundreds of servers, we have almost four petabytes of managed data, um, we have um, a very um, sophisticated network, and we've established a private cloud that allows us to meet all the, the business demands for simulations and data analytics. And, and we've done that with the help of IBM Platform Computing. You go back three decades ago, it was the dawn of CAD software, yeah. you know, sailboats to the America's Cup, yeah. Formula One racing, et cetera. And then you're good, and then hope for the best. Yes, right now, right. you know, fast forward, everything's data driven from inception, design, build, yep. and then even live, and then post-mortem of, say, Formula One. So take us inside kind of the, the magnitude of the data and what goes on. I mean, obviously real-time telemetry coming off the cars during the races. I mean, is the cars fully instrumented 100%? And then what's the CIO challenge behind, yep. the, under, under the hood, so to speak? Yeah, so, so the car is instrumented. It has more than 100 sensors on, on it. And when the car is running, we have engineers at the track looking at telemetry. But we also have a, an MPLS connection back to an operations room at our factory in Milton Keynes, England. And we have 20 engineers that are consuming telemetry and really understanding at an in-depth level what's happening with the car, how hard we can push it to, to finish as high as we can in the race. So you know, my big challenge is to make sure all of the infrastructure just works, engineers get the data they need in a timely fashion so they can make the right decisions. Share an anecdote with the fans out there about um, just an example where you had the real-time data, a tweak, a change, something significant, game-changing around the, uh, the product. Yeah, I think uh, the most compelling example we had was in 2012 when Sebastian Vettel was trying to win the Drivers' Championship. It went down to the very last race, and on the first lap of that last race, he was in an accident, the car was damaged, and we basically had to micromanage the car for the entire length and do just well enough in order for him to finish and win the championship. So now, if he doesn't finish, he doesn't win. If he doesn't finish, Alonso wins. He's second, <laughs> and going second in Formula One is going nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, with uh, the real-time feeds, and we were able to go and look at forces in the operations room compared against the design and what the car could withstand, and we were able to go and instruct Sebastian on how he could nurse the car, and he literally did just enough, and he won over the whole season the championship by two points. So you're talking very low tolerance this year, right? Very, One very low tolerance. Forget it. That's forward. right. That's right. <laughs> and um, so. So yeah, that, that was the, the most high profile example of data analytics and where it's made um, a, a big difference in the race outcome. So and how what, much would, is what, that? Would, what would he have done differently if you didn't have the instrumentation? Was, I mean, and nursing the car, what does that mean? Like how to take a corner, speed, is it all that? And he would have probably wouldn't have been aware of that? Yeah, so he had to change the engine mode, for example, because the exhaust um, had been dented. And if we pushed the car as hard as possible, the exhaust would have cracked and the car would not have finished. So we had to instruct him on how to set the control systems on the car. We had to instruct him on how hard he could actually push it accelerating. When we took a pit stop, we also had to adjust the wing angles to adjust the balance on the car, and all that was on the advice of people back in England. Simulating. Uh, yeah, simulating, understanding what, what was actually happening via telemetry, and recommending back to the mechanics at the track on how to fix or set up the car and adjust So real-time, you had, you had engineers in England, 
guiding you guys, translating it to the yeah, driver. That's right. And there's certain things the driver can do in real time, certain things that's he can't right. do that's that you right. had to do in the in the pits. That's exactly right. So how 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 far has this come in the last ten years? I mean, maybe you could describe sort of that journey. Yeah, well, 10 years ago, it was not possible. Um, we didn't have the data networks that could get the data back to an operations room, nor did we have the analytical tools that allowed you to digest it, simulate things, and take very quick decisions. So we've now had an operations room for about seven years, and we've taken lots of baby steps, adding incremental capability. And right now, we can't do without it. It's a big differentiator with track performance. So 10 years ago, it was gut feel. It was gut feel. It was, yeah, experience. People at the track had telemetry, so the people at the track could see see the data with with tools that were not as sophisticated as what we have today. And today, we can now include all the brains back at the factory, get them involved, so we have more eyeballs on the car, more specialization and expertise around engineers on the car, and they can get the data real time, no matter where the racetrack is in the world. It goes, the data goes back to headquarters in England. How did you deal with with potential conflicts and discrepancies in in opinions, right? You always say they can't take the human out of the yep, out right. of the equation. Humans are the last mile. So how did you deal with that? Is it the is it the driver's call? Is it the pit crew's t call? Is it your um, call? Ulti no. <laughs> ultimately, um, so the pit wall at the track is the lead decision makers for a race. Christian Horner, who's our team principal, number one guy on the team, ultimately takes the calls if there's a hard decision. And he'll take advice and recommendations, but ultimately somebody may have to take a hard decision. Right. But mostly it's data driven or as much as, as can be. So what, maybe talk about the tooling a little bit. You said that that was a big advancement. Obviously, the being able to get the data to the right place is fast enough, so the pipes and the infrastructure. But what, what kind of tooling are you talking about? What kind of advancements have we seen there? So in, in the infrastructure, you mean? Yeah, so what we can do is with telemetry, we can do a lot of post-processing for the math channels, and we have a grid computer, or a few grid computers, um, in Milton Keynes in England, so we can run a lot of sophisticated post-processing and really get a real, an understanding of what our car is doing, um, recommendations on race strategy, and we can also get a very good idea of what our competitors are doing, figure out what their weaknesses are, attack and exploit their weaknesses, and where they have strengths, try to counterbalance the strengths. So, um, so we run Monte Carlo analysis real time, for example, on grid computers in England, and all of this provides de de uh, decision support and advice that gets fed back to the track in real time. So, that's awesome. All right, now, now we hear a lot of t uh, talk about cloud at this show. Um, you guys have built your own private cloud for That's the right. analytics system. I wonder if you could describe that a little bit. What does that look like? Paint a picture for us. Yeah, so um, so we have two types of, um, of supercomputers um, that are based on grid computing. And we've worked with IBM platform computing so that um, the environments are all defined by software. So we use um, Linux clusters and use LSF as a scheduling engine. And we do a lot of simulations for computational fluid dynamics to design, design the shape of the car. And the shape of the car actually evolves uh, for every race. We focus new parts and new updates depending on the track that we're going to. So the, the big LSF-based clusters run big CFD um, computational fluid dynamics simulations. The other type of cluster that we set up is a symphony cluster. And we're using this to do a lot of the data analytics uh, applications. Um, that we use real time at the track, so it can get real time in data telemetry, for example, do post processing and make, uh, for example, predictions about race strategy or recommendations on race strategy. So, obviously, as you say, the track you're customizing essentially the car for every race because, yeah. because of the track conditions and maybe the weather conditions as well That's and, right. and so forth. So you've got a lot of data That's right. that you, you utilize. You know, we were talking earlier about gut feel. I remember. In the early 2000s, the Harvard Business Review wrote a number of articles talking about how, how gut feel essentially trumps data. That's changed quite yeah. a bit. It's still a, a big component of gut feel, but part of the, the, the suggestion back then was minimize the number of KPIs because it gets too complicated. So my question yeah. to you is, is that still the strategy or, or are you able to optimize on a wider range of, of indicators or does it really just come down to a a few key ones, you know, tire wear or whatever. No, there, there's so many variables that we're managing, and we still rely not so much on gut feel, but we still very much rely on experienced engineers. Mm -hmm. um, but we try to give them better data so that they can make even better decisions than what they would have in the past with with experience and gut feel. So you still can't take the person out of the loop. <laughs> have you seen situations where it was one of these non-intuitive 
you know, things. I, I mean, I think about instrument flight rules when you're flying a plane. It's, yeah. you know, it's, it's, you usually got to follow your instruments, especially if you're, you know, IFR only. Yeah. Have you se seen situations where it was so non-intuitive and you either went with the data or you went with experience and and, and, and maybe had a, had a learning as a result of that? Yeah. I think if I go back to the example with Sebastian in 2012 where he had an accident to the first lap, so the first gut instinct was coming to the pits you know, on the very next lap you know, and let the mechanics try to deal with the damage. But the reality was is the mechanics couldn't fix the, the damage that was done. So it was um, people in the ops room in England saying, guys, there's nothing we can do about it. Hold fire, keep them at the Don't track. Don't bring them in Don't because that's just going to kill you. Just buy time and let us let us try to figure out exactly what's going on here, but don't bring them in. So that was one where people at the, in the ops room were a step removed from the emotion, um, had the data, and um, and, and you know, made a call that um, turned out to be the right decision. So you guys are, um, obviously you're here at Pulse, you're an IBM customer. What's your relationship with IBM? Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so with IBM, we've been um, a longtime customer, and IBM is also an innovation partner for the team. So um, platform computing technology, we're very lead um, users of the technology. We work in a very collaborative manner to, um, to define our software environment, or use software to define our hardware environment for simulations. Um, so we're both um, um, a customer and we're an innovation partner with IBM. So why don't you talk about the role of, of the CIO, you and your colleagues, you're always talking about things like business alignment and agility and so forth. What are the pressures that, that you're seeing on the CIO today? Um, how have they changed and you know, how are, is your community responding to them generally and you specifically? Okay, so Formula One is um, a very technical, technology-based um, sport, and um, so because um, technology touches every part of the company, from design to manufacturing to analytics at the track, every everybody wants to continuously improve. So the car is always improved but we also have huge pressure to improve our applications and improve the capability of our infrastructure. And so that's why um, cloud computing really helps out because as the business de demands explode, it gives us an ability to also scale up our infrastructure to meet all these incremental demands. And when we talk about cloud computing, you're essentially building a private cloud that, that might simulate what, you've, what we've come to know as, as the public cloud, self-service, provisioning, you know, yep. agility, lots of services, service catalog, is that right? I mean, yep, where are correct. you in that whole journey? Would you say that you've got a private cloud that, that provides comparable capabilities to the user base as that you know public cloud infrastructure yeah. as we know it? Are you a little somewhat behind, somewhat ahead in certain areas? I, wonder if you can talk I, about I think that. we're a leader, actually. Um, we've put a lot of effort in over many years now. We've been working with IBM and platform computing since 2008, and the environment went from something that was quite inflexible and wasn't meeting the needs of the business to now actually meeting the needs, the needs of the business, being very proactive and, um, and having um, um, an extensible infrastructure that allows us to react to change quite quickly. I wonder if I could play devil's advocate uh, for, for a second on, on, on this topic, um, because there may, there may be some naysayers, I'm sure there are, right? There's always disagreements in organizations. You might say, well, yeah, maybe that's true that you can sort of replicate that, but from a cost standpoint, um, Maybe it's cheaper to do in-house, actually. I'll be, mm. I'll be curious as to your thoughts there, but what about it from an asset utilization perspective, i.e. pay by the drink, mm. on, on, on demand type of computing? Are you able to sort of simulate those benefits? Mm. So historically, we've done everything on-premise, mm -hmm. um, and it's really been the most cost-effective, and, and I think some of the, the offerings in hybrid cloud or public cloud just haven't been mature enough. So we've done everything on-premise historically. Now the, the, the technology is moving on, and we're starting to put our toe in the water and try to understand what the opportunities are around hybrid cloud. So from that hybrid point of view, we're very much at um, infancy point of view. But um, from a private cloud point of view, we're very much leaders. So you, you, would, you would agree then that rental is most typically more expensive than ownership, right? Yeah, in, in the past when we've looked at it, it definitely was. And, um, and because of who we are and how high profile we are, we can also get very attractive commercial terms to allow us to do things on premise. And when we, in the past, have looked at doing things outside, the economics didn't work. But I think now with all the investment and all the 
the different companies that are innovating, I think the dynamics of that will change. And uh, exactly when, don't know yet, but we, we know we need, to be, we need to watch it. Yeah. And Final question for you I want to ask you, just kind of going forward, given your experience, obviously Formula One, great, you know, obviously marquee sport. Yep. Um, it kind of mirrors the Internet of Things, if you think about it. So you're, you're dealing with real time, sensor data, this could be running turbines, airplane, airplanes, some elementary, it could be mobile phones, could be cars in the future. Um, for the folks out there trying to understand this whole cloud, real time, big data world, what advice would you give them about what you've done and where you see it going? Okay, so I think um, number one, it's to work with your partners in Pharma Vision about the art of the possible and um, know sort of where you went ahead. But then Big Bang doesn't work. It's taking lots of little steps to, to make continuous improvements to implement things. So I think, yeah, get the vision and then start working on it. Matt here, uh, Kaju with uh, Red Bull Racing Team, Infinity Red Bull Racing, CIO. Um, dynamic environment, uh, this is the future. You, <laughs> you're living the future, literally, you know, Formula One, we think mirrors the future. So congratulations, one, on a great uh, opportunity you've done. Or certainly the results speak for itself. Okay. Snatching victory from the jaws of defeat with big data. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, this is this is the future. Real time, using big data with computing power and a team of experts making things happen. That's the future. This is theCUBE. We are the future. We're here at IBM Pulse. We'll be right back after this short break.